Good morning. Let's all stand together and sing a little bit this morning. I'm, my voice is struggling, so you're going to have to really sing extra hard this morning, extra loud, and lift your voices. Right in the lobby, 
that uh, are for you to take. It talks about our upcoming events for the months of November and December through at the end, end of the year. And you can give these to your friends. It's got a little QR code on the back, takes them to our website, and it uh, gives them a little bit of information. So pick these up, invite some folks to the end, end of the year. This is the time to invite people. Uh, people are beginning to think about, you know what, I may go to church on Christmas this year. I may do something different and try to go to church. This is the time to do that, okay? So we do have Christmas Day service. December 25th, Christmas Day, 10 a.m. Your kids will be up 5.30 anyway, so don't worry about it. You know, you got to come up here anyway. Um, I don't know if you guys heard, but there was a dude who was suing. You guys have heard of the, the water company, the water bottle people that they make smart water. Have you all seen that smart water? The dude is suing the company because he's been drinking it and he's not any smarter. It's a true story. I know, yeah, that's right, yeah. So today I'd like to formally announce uh, that I'll be suing Thin Mints starting tomorrow because I've been eating them for three months. And Come on, Jeremy, stay with me. <laughs> I don't know. We're glad you guys are here. If you're a guest of ours, we want to thank you for being a part of our worship today. It's a joy to worship with you. We want to ask that you do us a favor. That is to take the Connect card that's in the seat back in front of you and to fill it out. If you don't mind, we would love to introduce ourselves to you, share some of the things that God is doing at our church. And uh, we've got a gift bag that's got uh, goodies for you as well as some information about our church as well. So if you'll do that, that Connect card's right in the seat back. Fill it out and you can meet me right at our Connect table that's in the lobby and I will meet you there and be able to introduce you to everyone everybody and, and uh, answer any questions you may have, all right? Uh, a few quick announcements. Number one, we've got our men's prayer breakfast is coming up this Saturday, the 19th. We've got over 40 guys signed up, and so we need you to, if you'd like to be a part of it, you'd like to meet some of the other guys in the church, both in the first hour and this hour. It is a great time to meet some of those guys that are going through the same daily struggles you are, raising families, uh, whatever the, the case may be in your life. We've got guys in the same shoes you're, you're in. So uh, it's a great time to meet some of those guys and, and to be introduced to them, pray together, be encouraged, and eat a great meal. And that's uh, this Saturday at 8 a.m., all right? Then we've got our Thanksgiving Sunday, November 20th. Next Sunday, not today, but next Sunday, we're going to have one service. One service, 10 a.m. Say 10 a.m. with me. 10 a.m. So don't come at 11. You come at 11, it's You'll just come to eat, but don't do that either. So come to 10 a.m. And <laughs> I know some of these people, man, I'm telling you. They're like, yep, right on time. Um, so 10 a.m. is when I'll, we'll worship all together in one room right here, and then we'll go eat. What we ask is we've got Ken and Dave, and some of those guys are going to smoke turkeys. Are y'all smoking them or frying them? Smoking. Okay, yeah. Smoking all these turkeys. I was telling people we were frying them at the H-E-B the other day. We were buying them. I didn't know. I was saying a lot of things, Roy. Uh, that's a whole long story. <laughs> yeah, we had like 30 turkeys in these carts. People were looking at us like, what are y'all stealing all these turkeys for? Uh, so that's going to be this coming Sunday, 10 a.m., in this room, everybody together, and then we'll eat right after that. It's going to be a great time. We'd love to have you guys. I think you'll enjoy it. What we ask is that you enjoy the meal that we're catering, and if you'll bring a dessert. Dessert, thank you. I've got one tres leches. Do I have two tres leches coming? Thank you. I see that hand. Uh, so we need a couple of those, and, and I was asked by some of our leadership on our serving teams that if you would bring your dessert in a uh, disposable container or a container that you don't mind not getting back because sometimes we get calls three months later, you know, like, I don't know what happened to the dish that I had. And we just would rather not have to go looking for everybody's dish. So bring something that you don't mind losing or disposable. Okay. And then lastly, we've got this Friday night. We've got a big weekend, man. This Friday night, we have our family movie night. Now you can sign up for this one at cbc.live. Go to cbc.live. You'll see the sign up button right at the front of the page. Click that. You'll see family movie night. So this Friday from six to eight, we'll be watching the star, uh, hot chocolate, popcorn, snacks, food, everything. It is a lot of fun. It was such a huge, big hit last year. We're doing it again. And you can also sign up for Men's Prayer Breakfast. I forgot to mention that at cbc.live as well. All right, let's pray. We're gonna get moving. God, we love you. We pray that your spirit would move in our hearts. Thank you for the joy of the Lord that is our strength and being able to um, 
sing with these people, to worship with these people, to open up your word, to hear your truth spoken, to apply it to our hearts and our lives, and know, God, that you're in control and you're sovereign, not only in this place, but in all of our hearts. God, move in us in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together as we continue worshiping this morning. And stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night. Cause you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. Oh, and I've seen many searching for answers far. Searching for answers, only you provide cause you know just what we need before we say a word. You're a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are. I'm loved by you, it's who I am.
My name is Bryce Pablo. I'm from Philippines in a small town called Sanchez Mira. When I was four years old, I received a shoe box. When I opened my box, I was so happy because I saw toy cars, stuffed toys, toothbrush, and some books. My dog's name is Poppy. My puppy follows me wherever I go. My mother encouraged me to go to church to learn more about God. When I was seven years old, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I'm so amazed with what God is doing. I saw the transformation of my son. Whenever he comes home, I see him reading the Bible. I shared the gospel to my parents and also to my brothers, and they accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior too. Because of that shoe box, God used me, and now I am discipling other children like me. We do not know God before. Our life was just full of traditions. I'm so grateful for the one who packed the shoe box that changed our life as a whole family. <clears throat> if you have your Bibles, uh, we're going to be in Titus chapter 2 this morning. Um, man, all those videos just make me emotional every time. We're out of the Samaritan's purse boxes that are red and green, but you saw in the video, there was a little Tupperware box about the size of a shoe box. So if you want to participate, you don't have to have one of the green and red boxes. Just pick up at Hobby Lobby or Target one of those little Tupperware boxes, or if nothing else, maybe you got an empty shoe box at home um, that you've been wearing the shoes, but the box is sitting there and you don't know why you're hanging on to it. Maybe it was for this. You can pack that box with those gifts. I think we still have some instruction cards to tell you kind of what Samaritan's Purse wants you to put in those boxes for those kids. It's such a tremendous thing that we're able to be a part of. And what I like about it is the community of faith from all over the world joins together in this endeavor and countless, countless children and families come to faith in Christ because of uh, other believers' willingness to give and be a part of someone's life that they may never get to meet in this life. But this, I can assure you, the Bible tells us that anything that we do for service to the Lord, he knows about it and he rewards it. And I just believe with all my heart that when we get to heaven, there might be some child or some adult who walks up to us and says, thank you for the gift that you gave because God used your gift to bring me to faith in him. And it's because of your love and your belief in him and what he promised that I'm here today because I just believe with all my heart, church, that we're going to be amazed when we get there what God did with the little sacrifices that we made to please and honor him. And I would also challenge you, we can do more than what we're doing right now, every single one of us. As I thought about what I wanted to speak to you about today because I, I kind of wrapped up my series last week and the Bible doesn't say that. And next week is Thanksgiving and we'll be in one service. And I do pray that you will be here, that you will bring someone with you next week who you are thankful for. I mean, what kind of better invitation could you give to someone than that? Our challenge at church next week is to bring someone who we are thankful for. And I am so thankful for you. Would you please join me to come to church next week? And then afterwards, we're going to have a huge Thanksgiving feast and it will be good. We got 32 turkeys that Brother Ken and Brother David are going to be smoking. So that's a lot of work. We want to make sure that their work is not in vain. Hey, Amen. We want to eat that turkey, right? We don't want to have a bunch of leftover. We want to finish it off. So you make sure and bring someone with you. Be here at 10 o'clock. We'll fill this house for the glory of God. And then we'll have a huge celebration next door in the Family Life Center when we're done. As I thought about what do I want to speak on on this one day, my thoughts went to one word. And the word is grace. We love the song, Amazing Grace. Do you love the song? I don't know that I've ever heard of a Christian 
who does not love the lyrics to this great spirit-filled, spirit-inspired song. The hymn is certainly timeless. It's old, but I'll tell you what, every time I hear it, it ministers to my heart. This song has been used of God to bring the lost to faith in Christ. This song has been used to restore the prodigal who has wandered away from God. This song has been used of God to comfort those who have been faced with tragedy and loss in their lives. This old song has been used of God in great times of joy as well as great times of sorrow. And I believe that every single born again child of God loves the message of this beautiful, beautiful song. I've heard the song done with different renditions, different artists. And I'm just going to be honest with you. It doesn't really matter to me who's singing it or if it's a more contemporary or an older version. It doesn't matter to me because the message is what ministers to my heart. And if you have not been in awe and just completely taken back by God's grace, then maybe it's because you've never truly experienced God's grace. Because I'm telling you, it is more than amazing. So I kind of sprung this on Landon and Brian's going to help him out, but they're going to come forward and we're going to sing this song together. But here's what, before we start, this is what I would say. I would ask you if you feel so moved, we can have an invitation before the message. If you, maybe something's on your heart, you just want to get alone with God at this altar and pray. Maybe you want to kneel at your seat where you're at and pray. Maybe you want to sing, or maybe you just want to close your eyes and take it in. However the Spirit of God moves you in this song right now, you can sing with them, but let's just stand together and let's take a moment and let the message of this song sink into our hearts together this morning. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious dear. That grace of you, the hour I first believed. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, his mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. The Lord has promised good to me, His word, my hope secure. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love. 
Let's just stay standing for the reading of the scripture in Titus chapter 2. We'll begin in verse 11. It says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Speak these things, exhort, and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you today for the privilege to be in your house. We thank you, God, for your word. And Lord, I pray this morning that in my weakness, God, that you would be made strong. I ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would move in this place. And Lord, move to those who might be watching and join us online. We just pray, God, that your spirit would use these words that are spoken today to bring people into a closer relationship with you. God, we love you and we do thank you. And we praise you, God, for your grace, because it is amazing. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Uh, before I dive into my message, I just feel led to say this. Wednesday night, if you were not here, Pastor brought just this message that just was just amazing. It's not, it's not like I never heard the message before he was talking about Abraham and Isaac and, and, and God moving in Abraham's life, telling him to bring his, his son, his only son who he loves, and to put him on an altar. And in that message, God spoke to me about something that he has been speaking to me about for a couple years, about something that, that I feel like he's been moving me to do here at Central. And... It's not earth shattering. It's not groundbreaking. It's not new. And so I had to ask the Lord to forgive me because I had not yet done as I know in my heart he had been telling me to do. So what I'm asking you to do this morning, I'm going to tell you what it is. I'm just going to ask you to pray for me that I will take the step of faith. And the reason I haven't, I was like, Lord, I mean, what if it's just me? Lord, what if it's me and only two or three? That could be real discouraging. And this is what I know he said to me. I don't care if it's one. I don't care if it's three. I don't care if it's a hundred. I'm telling you, this is what I want. So you pray for me because I really do hope to maybe bring some messages on it and then see this catch hold in this body of believers. And then we can sit back and watch what God will do with it as we act in obedience to him. So you pray for me. I'd appreciate that very much. I want boldness. And I want to have faith to just believe the Lord for the results. Amen? Because we have a lot of, this is a great church. We've got a lot of great programs and ministries. And I think those things are wonderful. Uh, but if that's what we're counting on to make us reach this community, our focus is wrong. So I love the song we just sang. It's powerful. It's effective. And like I said a moment ago, it's not because the music is beautiful. It's not because of the different artists who sing it. I believe that the song is effective and powerful because of the message and the story that it tells. Have you ever asked anyone to define grace for you? You ever done that? I, I do it sometimes if I'm in a witnessing situation and I'm having a good conversation with someone because, you know, I'm, I'm trying to present to them the message of God's grace. So a lot of times I'll ask them, can you define grace? You ever been asked? Have you been asked? I'm not gonna ask you right now, but be honest. Have you ever been asked to define grace? Raise your hand. A few of you have. Some of you haven't. See me after church, like your definition. Just teasing. 
I've asked some people to define grace and you know, it really depends who you ask the answer that you get. I've asked some people, how would you define grace? And some have responded, well, grace is that little prayer you say before you eat a meal, right? I mean, let's be honest. Well, you've heard people say, why don't you say grace for us? So some people in all honesty, and I really appreciate their honesty when they respond. Other people have said, well, grace is a type of very controlled, reserved, calm behavior, you know, like poise, like you see in a ballerina. I've honestly heard that as the description of grace. You know, they move with such grace and poise. And then I've heard Christians say, well, grace, it's just, it's really unexplainable. I want to tell you this morning how God defines grace in his word. His word tells us that his grace is the undeserved, unmerited love and favor of a righteous, of a holy, of an all-knowing, all-powerful, omnipotent, omnipresent God. And I will tell you this morning that his amazing grace is shown to every single person who has ever lived on this earth. When, when we take a moment and we just try to meditate and think on that thought, and we try to consider all that God's grace really means, I'm telling you, for me, it's just mind-blowing. The more I think about it, the more I realize that I really don't understand that much about God's amazing Grace, Because just as I start to think that I'm grasping it, it just like opens up a whole nother dimension, if you would, into how much God loves me. As great as the song is, there truly are, in my opinion, no words in the English language that are powerful enough to describe just how awesome and amazing the grace of God really is. I don't know about you, but for me, the fact that God was and is willing to show his grace to a sinful person like me is just more than words can speak. I will tell you this this morning. Any sinner who desires can be saved. Try to wrap your mind around that for a moment. We see people who are so sinful and so awful and so far away from God. Many times we think to ourselves, there's no way that person could ever come to faith in Jesus Christ. But that is contrary to what the word of God says. His grace is sufficient for all sinners. It means that it also means church that there's not a storm in life that he cannot use his grace to see you through it. You know, God's grace, it's not like, it's not like pour it all out on you at one time. Like today, I don't have grace for death, but I believe with all my heart because I've seen it that when people get sick and they're sick unto death, it's amazing to me, Josh, how I've seen them take it. And I'm sitting there on the outside looking in going, how do they seem so calm? It's because I don't have the grace for that right now, but God has given it to them when they need it. You don't have grace today for tomorrow's storm, but I can assure you that when you get there, the Lord will give you his grace to make it through. God's grace is always sufficient for any need and for any circumstance. There are many great passages of scripture in God's word that reference the grace of God, but the particular passage that we have read this morning from Titus, it is indeed to me one of the clearest and most descriptive on the subject of God's grace. And it also gives us a very clear explanation of the effects that God's grace has in our lives. It's more than just giving you the assurance that when you die, you will go to heaven. And today my prayer and my hope is that these Next few minutes, you would be encouraged as you learn more about God's grace. I want to share with you three facts that we see in this text about God's grace that truly do make it more than amazing. The first fact about grace is this. It is grace. It is the grace of God that saves us and redeems us from our sins. Titus chapter 2, verse 11, the very beginning, it says, For the grace of God that bringeth what? That bringeth salvation. It is 
by grace that we are saved. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, my favorite verse says, for by grace are you saved through faith. For by grace are you saved through faith. It's not of works. It's not by anything that we do. It's not merited. It's not earned. It's not deserved. It is God's free gift to sinful man. His grace is extended to you today. Romans chapter four, verses four and five says, now to him who works, listen to this, to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. Let me try to make it a little more clear. If Landon hired me to come out to his house and pull weeds, he would be a fool because I don't pull weeds very good. A lot better off calling Shirley. She's a good weed puller. She did it yesterday. Came in with it. I think she brought the weeds through the house so I'd see them. But anyways, that's neither here nor there. Um, but if I went to his house and I worked for him for the day, and then at the end of the day, he paid me for my service, guess what? This verse is saying, that's not grace. That's a debt that he owes me for the service that I provided. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. I've met so many people in my life who've told me as I tried to share with them God's love, God's gospel message of Jesus Christ, how he lived a sinless, perfect life, how he gave his life on the cross, and that if they will trust him and confess their sins to him, that he will forgive them, redeem them, make them new in Christ, and he will give them eternal life. I've had so many people have told me, Roy, you just don't know all that I have done. There is no way that God could ever forgive and save me. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 8 and 9 says, But he said that my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more, all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. The Apostle Paul, this is the Apostle Paul. Who was he before he became a child of God? He was the chief terrorist against Christians. We saw all throughout the, the, the Iraq war and the war in Afghanistan where every now and then these terrorists would line people up who profess faith in Jesus, put a bag over their head, and I'm sorry to make it so graphic, but they would take a machete and cut their heads off to kill them, persecuting them for their claimed faith in Jesus Christ. That is what the apostle Paul was before he came to faith in Christ. Don't tell me you've done too much to be saved if God could save the apostle Paul. Think about the thief on the cross. He was hanging on the cross because he had committed murder. He had stolen. He was a liar. He was a cheater. He lived his whole life in rebellion against God and his word. And in the final moments of his life, because I've had people say to me, well, I don't know about those last minute salvation experiences. I don't know about those prisoners on death row professing faith in Jesus Christ just because they're scared about dying. Well, if you're not a Christian, death should scare you. Because the Bible tells us what your destination will be. And it's a horrific, horrific place. But God's grace is available to all mankind. The thief on the cross simply said, I mean, he didn't go through this long ordeal confessing every sin he had ever committed. He asked the Lord, please, when you enter into your kingdom, would you just at least remember me? And Jesus said to him, today you'll be with me in paradise. I don't care, friend, what you've done, how far you feel like you have fallen. God's grace is can reach you right where you are. Romans chapter five, verses 20 and 21 says, moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. When we are confronted with the law of God, the 10 commandments, we see how sinful we are because I don't know about you, but I've broken the commandments of God. No, I've never physically killed anybody. Thou shalt not kill. But Jesus came along and he said, but if you hate your brother, you've killed him in your heart and you're guilty of that commandment. Is anyone here this morning so bold to stand before this congregation and God and say, I'm not guilty? I didn't think so. <laughs> you're with me. I'm guilty. Guilty as charged. But to this church, grace brings salvation to man. 
And that means that the recipients of God's grace have been cleansed, forgiven of sin through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus is not a way to be saved. Jesus is the way to be saved. Ephesians 1, 7 says, in him, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of what? His grace. Not only does the shed blood of Jesus cleanse us from sin and unrighteousness, listen, church, it also delivers us from the penalty of sin. Romans 6.23 tells us that the wages, the penalty, the price, the payment for our sin, what we do deserve in our sinful fallen state is death. But the gift of God, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. John 10.27-30, through 30, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them and they follow me, and I give them eternal life. And they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. And I and my father are one. The grace of God also guarantees us an eternity in heaven when this life is over. And unless the trumpet of the Lord sounds and we are resurrected together, I've got news for you today. It's not good news, but it's a factual news. And that is that every single one of us one day will die. The Bible says it is appointed unto men once to die. And after this, the judgment. Every single one of us, if, if we don't live to the sounding of the trumpet, we will die and we will stand immediately before God in judgment to receive those things done in the body, whether they be good or whether they be bad. God's grace guarantees us eternal life. Jesus assured us with his own words in John 14, one through three, when he said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Jesus said, I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, you may be also. Heaven is not a figment of our imagination. It's not rainbows and unicorns. It's for real, folks. It's a real place. And people either go there or they get separated from God for all eternity in a terrible place that was not made for mankind. It was made for Satan and his demons. But every person has a choice where they're going to spend eternity. Either they choose to accept Jesus and the sacrifice that he has made for their sins, or they choose to reject him and go at it on their own. Every one of us have a choice. First of all, know this, gr the grace that God shows towards man saves us. The second fact about grace is this. It is the grace of God that teaches us how to live the Christian life. I don't know about you, but I've been a Christian for 41 years. I got saved when I was nine years old, sitting at the top of our steps at 8314 Wayward after my sister and I were having a bad argument and we had heard our grandpa refer to himself as a demon and a friend of the devil. So we started calling each other the devil and making very just, you know, mean remarks toward one another. And my dad could have just sent us both to our rooms, come in there and, and spanked us both and made us kiss and make up. But rather he used that opportunity to sit us down and explain to us why we weren't devils and why we weren't demons. And that way we were created in the image and the likeness of God so that we could have fellowship with him. And he presented the gospel to us. And at nine years old, I didn't understand much, but I believed that God loved me. And I asked him to come into my heart and he saved me on that very day. And I'll tell you the truth, I've committed way more sins since then than I did leading up to that day. But it's difficult, even at 50 years old, as a 41-year-old Christian, sometimes it's difficult to live the Christian life and know exactly what God wants of me. But it is his grace that teaches us how to live the Christian life. Titus 2.12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, that's what we're to avoid then it tells us what we're to pursue. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly 
in this present world. The grace of our Lord tells us what to avoid. Avoid ungodliness, avoid worldly lust, and it teaches us what to pursue. Pursue a, a, a sober life, a life that is clearly intentional about living according to the word and will and way of God. Live righteously and godly. First Corinthians 10 31 says, therefore, whether you eat or drink, I love this next statement, or whatever you do, wherever you go, whoever you're with, in all things, do all to the glory of God. If you're doing something, saying something, act in a certain way, and in the same breath you can't say, and I do this to give glory to God, then guess what? You shouldn't be saying it, doing it, or going there. You say, I thought you were going to encourage me. I am. Encouraging you not to do what will destroy your witness and your testimony. There's so many times where I got impatient and, and, and showed my anger. And then in the next moment, God opens up the door for me to witness. And I'm ashamed to because of the way I just behaved. If it's just me, you can say shame on him. But I have a good feeling I'm not alone in that. Guys, whatever we do, we should always do it with a desire and a goal to glorify God. His word calls us to avoid ungodliness and worldly lust. He calls us to a life of purity. Many people I've witnessed to have it. They, they believe in God. And in my witnessing, I can tell they believe that Jesus Christ gave his life for them so they could be saved. But here's why they don't come. Because they don't want to live a life of purity. At least they're honest enough to say, I still have sinful things that I want to do. And I don't think it'd be right for me to give my life to Christ and then continue on in the pursuit of those sinful desires. I've been saved 41 years. I told you just now, I've committed more sins since then than I did before. But I'll tell you something. We should never live to desire the pursuit of ungodly things and worldly lust. I'll be a witness. Those times where I thought about it and I just tried to convince myself it's okay. And I went ahead. Oh, the feeling was miserable. Do you know what I'm talking about this morning? How the spirit of God brings conviction in your heart and you just can't enjoy those things that you once enjoyed because now you are the bought and purchased and paid for property of Jesus Christ who shed every ounce of his blood so that he could forgive you of his sins. There is no joy and lasting fulfillment in a life that is lived contrary to the word, the will, and the way of God. Colossians chapter 3 verses 5 through 10 says, Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. But now you yourselves are to put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie one to another since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. His word also warns us and instructs us in 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 8. It says, be sober, be vigilant. And here's why. Because your adversary, your enemy, the devil, he is like a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he might devour. Guys, listen, we have to know. This is a warning from the word of God given to us by the apostle Peter. We have an enemy. And he's real. He's as real as heaven is real. We have an enemy who is completely sold out to his one mission. And that is to destroy our lives. He wants to rob you of the joy that comes in having a relationship with Jesus Christ. He wants to destroy your witness and your testimony. He wants to stop us from being able to impact this world for the kingdom of God. And I'm telling you this morning, the Lord has given us everything that we need in his grace for us to fight against him. And we do it in the power of the Lord's might. We have to put on the whole armor of God if we're going to fight against the wicked schemes of our enemy, the devil. And if you don't think he's real, then you've never really tried to live for Jesus because he is real and he will come at you. In Ephesians chapter 10, verses, chapter 6, verses 10 through 18, the apostle Paul wrote, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. If you're trying to be strong in yourself, 
you'll fail. But when we're taking a stand for the kingdom of God and we're trying to be strong according to his word, according to his will, then we can stand. He said, put on the whole armor of God that you may, may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but we are fighting, we are battling, we are wrestling against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness in this age, against spiritual host of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may, may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Let me tell you something, friends. This is a weapon of warfare. That's why the Bible tells us to study it, to show ourselves, to prove a workman that needeth not be ashamed. We need to have our nose in this book every day of our lives. If you expect to go out into a sin-filled world where you're going to be attacked, where Satan is going to try to discourage you, you had better prepare yourself with the word of God. This is a weapon of warfare. And the war that we are fighting is a spiritual one. It's not against the co-worker who's antagonistic against your faith. It's not against that family member who lives under the same roof as you, who is always challenging you on your beliefs. It's not against them. It's against the enemy, the devil. And he will use people. He wants us to react to our friends, to our acquaintances to our loved ones in a way that doesn't bring honor and glory to God. Be careful. The battle and the fight is real. How does the Lord want us to live? Romans 12, 17 through 21. Repay no one evil for evil. I don't know about you, but that gets me. You ever get wronged and you're like, okay, I'll show you. You think you're the only one that can do a mischievous act? I'll show you. You think you hurt me? You haven't seen nothing yet. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, listen to this. My wife's favorite verse. As much as depends on you. You can't control the actions and the behaviors of someone else, but as much as depends on you. Live peaceably with all men. We can't respond evil for evil, bad for bad. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves. Don't try to get even for what someone has done wrong to you, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, listen, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. You don't have to seek revenge for the things that people have done to you. What you should be doing is praying that they would experience the same forgiveness that you experience. But trust me, if they don't, they will experience a payment that you do not wish upon them. You ever seen an enemy suffer and then deep down inside, you're like, now I feel sorry for them. That's a good thing that you feel that way because we should not want to see our enemies suffer. We should want them to experience and know the same grace that we know. He says, therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, Give them something to drink. For in, listen to this. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, I've seen this too. My enemies hurt me, so I'm going to go be real nice to heap coals on their head. If that's the motivation, it's not working. That's not the way it works. The 
but I've seen it true. I know it's true. All throughout scripture, we're instructed how to, how we're to deal with our fellow man. And guys, listen, let's just be honest this morning. We're all friends here, right? We're friends. The problem (laughs) is my flesh is 100% contrary to the spirit that lives inside of me. Even Paul said, the things that I know I should do, I don't. And the things I know I shouldn't do, I do. But that is no excuse for us to say, well, the apostle Paul said it. I must be as good as him. Colossians 3, 15 through 17 says, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which also you were called in one body and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. First fact, it's the grace of God that saves us. Second fact, it's the grace of God that teaches us how to live this Christian life. And thirdly, I'll close with this one. The grace of God gives us our eternal hope. Titus 2.13 says, looking for that blessed hope. The hope that we have, church, in Christ gives us hope for today as well as for all eternity. As Christians, we're not just holding out hope for that day way off yonder. No, we are living in that hope right now. Jesus assured his followers again in John 14 when he said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Jesus said, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna make a place ready for you. And when it's ready, I'll come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you can be also. First John 3, one through three. Behold what manner of love the father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But listen to this, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Revelation twenty two twenty. As John wrote, the Bible's closing out. He who testifies of these things says, speaking of Jesus, surely I come quickly. And then John adds, amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. I close with this church. Jesus is coming again. Whether you believe it or not, Jesus is coming again. And in the interim, we must live our lives in a manner, in a way, with a specific conduct that would cause us, listen to this, to anticipate and be excited for his return, not dread it. As a young Christian, I would say things like, I know the Lord's coming again, but don't want it to be right now. I want to, you know, grow up and date and get married and have kids. And if I'd known all then what I know now, I would have said, Lord Jesus, come today. No, no, it's been a joy. I'm teasing. I was just seeing if you're listening. <laughs> let, me, let me just tell you why we feel that way many times. In fact, probably all the time that we don't want him to come right now. Why we're dreading his return? Because we know that if he showed up, right in this moment. We wouldn't be pleased with what he sees in our lives. Let me tell you something. The trumpet doesn't have to sound and he doesn't have to show up to resurrect us to see what's exactly in our lives right now. If you're not a Christian, you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, He knows you. 
He loves you. He sacrificed himself to save you from your sins. What you need to do is just humble yourself before the Father and admit that you've sinned and that you need the forgiveness that's offered and made available through the grace of God and him giving his son Jesus Christ to shed his blood for your sins. That's all you have to do. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Not go to confession, not tell the preacher, not confess to every person you've ever wronged. You confess your sin to Jesus Christ and name him as the Lord of your life and you will be saved. If you are a Christian and you say, you know, I've been struggling. This Christian life's tough. You're not alone. It is tough. But the Lord's never commanded us to do something that he himself will not strengthen and empower us to do. We can. Don't say you can't. That's a slap in the face to God. We can live the life that he has called us to live. But we must do it in the power of the Spirit of God. Would you bow your heads with me? Jesus said in Matthew 24, 44, as Brother Landon comes, he says, Therefore, you also be ready. Speaking of believers, of disciples, of followers of Christ, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming in an hour that you do not expect. I'll be honest with you. Jesus could come today. He could come right now in, in the next second. And I'll also be honest, he may not come for another 2,000 years. I don't know when he's coming. But I do know that he is coming. And if we die before he comes, we'll meet him face to face the moment that we take our last breath on this earth. And if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, maybe you have religion, but religion won't save you from your sin. Only a relationship with Jesus will do that. You can have a relationship with him right now if you'll confess and repent of your sin to him and invite him into your heart and life. It's just an act of humility, acknowledging that you can't do it on your own, that you need him and his grace. If you'll do that right now in the quietness of your own heart, he'll save you. No special magic words. Just talk to him. Talk to God. He'll listen. Maybe you're here and you say, you know what? I'm a Christian, but man, I'm struggling. I've got, got these battles. I've got these issues. I've got these sins. I've got things that just constantly are coming at me, and I just struggle. You're not alone. Every Christian in here, if they were honest, would have to raise their hand to that and say, yeah, I too got some issues. So my, my, my call to you is, would you just press into him? Because he's the only one who can give you the ability to stand and the strength to fight against those things. You stand with me. I'm going to pray and then I want to just open up this altar. Maybe you just need to talk to God about something. Maybe your heart is broken and no one seems to be able to help. Let me tell you, there's one who can help, who will help who's waiting for you just to turn to him, and his name is Jesus. Father, we thank you today for your love for us. We thank you, God, and we praise you, God, that we have this great privilege to be in your house. And Lord, I pray right now that each of us would respond to you as you have spoken to us. And God, may you receive all the glory and all the praise for what you do in our lives, in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you come as Brother Landon sings? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now. Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first. Chains are gone, I've been set free.
my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. What's the challenge this week? Next week, Thanksgiving Sunday, tell someone you're thankful for them. They may not have any clue what a blessing they have been in your life. I have friends who don't know Jesus who are huge blessings in my life, and they have no idea how their life has impacted mine. You'd be amazed what might happen in the life of someone else as a result of you being willing to open up and be vulnerable and tell someone how their life has been a blessing to you. Tell them it's the Sunday where we're supposed to bring someone we're thankful for, and I couldn't think of anybody better than you. Would you come and be my Thanksgiving friend? I'll tell you what, if we would just do that, whether they came or not, we might be shocked in the days, months, and years ahead how God would use that kind of an invitation. So I challenge you this week, invite someone tell them you're thankful for them and you want to show them off to your church family. I pray you have a blessed week. Pick up those invite cards. It's got our events all the way through uh, Christmas Day service. And some people say well, Christmas Day. Well, it falls on a Sunday and it is his birthday. So we're going to come and worship him at 10 o'clock. And the last time this happened, we thought we we're going to have a terrible crowd. I'll tell you, it was one of the most full days of the entire year. So let's make Christmas Day a wonderful celebration of the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.